fam, before we get started, I gotta give a special shout out to my guy, Herman Hudson of the Hudson Mortgage Team, powered by Fairway Mortgage. If you're looking to refinance or to purchase your first home or to purchase a home in general, you gotta hit up my guy Herman Hudson. You gotta hit up my guy Herman because him and his team have over 20 years of experience in conventional FHA, VA, first time home buyer experience, and also down payment assistance. So it's only right. So with all that being said, 3 Millie Pod fan, before we get back into the show, let the Hudson team help you mortgage your future. Let's get it. We got this. We did it again. <laughs> we did it again. Yes, Once sir. it reached me, can't pass me, Kayla. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Kaba, like what I've told you multiple times on the phone, this is beyond an honor from following you for six years plus now. Um, as someone who loves history, it is a pleasure to be able to have a great discussion with you. So I appreciate it. My brother, I appreciate you and I appreciate all that you're doing. Together, That's we're going to make this happen. That's right, doctor. That's right. On the phone, um, Everything that you were telling me was so dynamic, so interesting. And you told me that before we eventually talk to or talk about the Moors. So you already know that you will be back <laughs> multiple times. Uh, first, we will talk about the origins of life in Africa. So from there, I will give you the floor. We can start. And I'm just here just to listen and to ask questions. Well, you, you know, Brother Caleb and, and to the community uh, of Three Millipod, uh, one of the first things that I always attempt to do is to answer certain questions. Mm -hmm. You know, we all read about Shakespeare say to be or not to be. Right. That is the question. And that is the question. That is the fundamental question of life, to be or not to be. And to do that, you got to go back to understand the foundations of who and what you are, where you came from. Mm. And the reality is that we go back and when you go through the process of what we call evolution, I call it life's history. You begin to realize that because of the nature of science, not personal, you know, uh, the reality is, is that for an organism to exist, and there are three laws in science. One of them is called Glozier's law, G-L-O-G-E-R. One of them is Allen's law, A-L-L-E-N. And the other is Bergman's law, B-E-R-G-M-A-N-N. -N. Because, my brother Caleb, I sincerely believe in science, not emotion. Mm -hmm. What we have to present to our people, who are so brilliant in so many different ways, multi-talented, multi-geniuses, one of the things that we seek is science. Now, science doesn't mean like we think of biology and astronomy, oceanography, that is science, but science comes from the word scient, S-C-I-E-N-T, which means to know. Hmm. Science is knowledge. It's not just one area or subject areas. It's all knowledge altogether. To understand who we are as a people, we have to go back and understand what is it that brings life into existence and how would it have happened that it happened in Africa? Because if the direct sunlight had shown on Beijing, China, hmm. black folk would be from China. That's right. Africa is, is the reality of that part of the, the continent, because there was only one continent at, at, at one time. Yep. We, in science, we call it Pangea. Right. Our ancestors in the Shabaka stone called it Pata, hmm. the hill, the primordial hill that rises up out of the water which is that one continent that rose up out of the water. Mm. And if you look at any map, what you'll notice is that Africa is in the middle of that continent. Mm. And if you notice what we call the Great Lakes region, the countries we today call Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Congo, yeah. and parts of Southern Africa, they're at the top of the hill. Mm. So imagine this huge continent coming up out. It's, they're all connected. But in the middle of the hill is the African continent. Right. That is why Africa can have reverberations of an earthquake, but they can't have an earthquake because Africa sits on one plate. Mm. What creates earthquakes is that you have 
plates, tectonic plates that shift. Yeah. And in shifting, that's what creates the earthquake. Mm -hmm. Africa does not sit hmm. on multiple plates. It only sits on one plate because that's the top of the hill. Everything else is on plates, mm -hmm. but Africa is on one plate. The direct sunlight constantly on this part of the continent, particularly Africa, but specifically the Great Lakes region, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Congo, Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. This is why when you look in Africa, in that part of the world, Kenya, Uganda, that's where all the game is. That's where you have the lions. That's where you have the gorillas. Right. Every animal that exists in the world exists in Africa. Even the dog came from Africa. Even the horse, hmm. the original zebra, came from Africa. So that when you, and um, uh, flora the same way. When I say flora, I mean plants and botany. Every type of plant that could exist, exists in Africa. Wow. It may be replicated in other parts of the world, that is true. Yeah. But you got it in Africa. And also, fam, since this is the first time I'm with you, can I tell you what I tell everybody? Please. Don't believe a word I say. It's here to make me think. Because I'm not here for you to believe me. I'm here to right. encourage you to think. That's right. Because once we start thinking, we can come to conclusions mm -hmm. that will be able to assist us in making the decisions in our life that we need to make. Mm -hmm. So here in this general location, you are going to go through a series of different types of life, organic life. At one time, our Earth being thrown out from our sun, because all of the planets and asteroid belt and all that are all pieces of that gas giant we call the sun. <laughs> yeah. The sun is our parent. The sun is our mother and father, the source from whence we all come, including the planets. And so the Earth being the third planet from the sun, third world to be exact, mm -hmm. What you had is it was a gaseous ball like its parent that was thrown out. And so it, it although it was thrown out, it was pulled in by centripetal and centrifugal force that allowed it to revolve around the sun. Just like a child revolves around his or her parents, it's the mm -hmm. same story. This is how I used to tell my five year olds in kindergarten this story about astronomy. Wow. About the sun and about the planets and all the other things that exist. We can teach our children these stories because life starts out of cosmology. It's very important for us to understand the very first thing, the first most important thing that exists in human intellect is numbers, mm -hmm. mathematics. Mm -hmm. Mathematics then becomes the language of science. And so in understanding these concepts, what begins to happen is you see that this gaseous ball being thrown into space, it's hot, very hot. However, in interstellar space, where it's cool, it begins to balance. And as it begins to balance, the Earth's core starts to solidify. And it starts to have different types of geological events like earthquakes and volcanoes and Different things happen in the core of the earth, which is pushing this land up through the water. And eventually, the land comes up and remains above the water. Dr. John G. Jackson said that that rising of the uh, land, then it was overtaken by the water again. And then millions and millions of years later, another land go up. The water come over. John G. Jackson, great scholar, said that happened maybe five times until this one volcano was so powerful, it came up and that land, Pangea, stayed above the water. And that's when the direct sunlight started to hit it. As it began to hit it, life began to occur in the waters. It started with bacteria, archaea. That's where it started, bacteria. That was the single cell protozoa. I'm talking science now, not emotion. Right. And then out of this bacteria, there started to grow what we would consider to be plants on a very elementary level. From the single cell became multi-cell. From multi-cell became fish. From fish, there came amphibian. Hmm. The fish was the entity that could 
live in the water and had gills for lungs. Then, for whatever reason, some of them started getting up on land. Hmm. Then they would return to water. So they had gills at one point, but they could also breathe through what was forming as lungs. Until the amphibian who was comfortable in water and land began to develop and stay only on the land. Mm. And that was the birth of the reptiles. Mm. And then coming up out of the reptiles, we had an entity that was called hadraconium. Hadraconium is no bigger than the top digit on your pinky. That is the ancestor of the mammals. That's where we came from. Now, I understand through religious dogma and story, we see a concept of a god forming a human out of clay. Okay, that's religion. <laughs> and if you believe that, I respect you. Yeah. You have a right to believe that. Yeah. But, I, but I'm telling you a story where I'm coming from, which is science, which I think has more validity as to our own soul searching to know who we are. Right. So hadraconium began to develop going on, going on, in the interest of time. Eventually, we had an entity that was in the trees. Some people call it Ramapithecus. A lot of people have their different names for it. However, what occurred is that some, Ram some Ramapithecus, for whatever reason, began to look down on the earth. Maybe they, were, maybe they fell out the tree. <laughs> maybe they were kicked out the tree by another Ramapithecus. <laughs> But whatever happened, or maybe searching for food, mm. what that Ramapithecus did was remain on the ground and did not come back up into the tree. Mm. And so now you have a life form that's evolving on the ground, the grasslands, and you have a life form that's developing in the tree. The one in the tree is called Pongids. These would be who we today call apes, gorillas, chimpanzee, orangutan. Then you have the, the hominids, which was on the earth. The hominids went through, according to Dr. Shekhan to Diop, six different formations. Started with the Orsolopithecine. Orsolopithecines or the Orsolopithecus robustus. Robustus became Orsolopithecus gracile. Gracile became Homo habilis, which is the human of ability. Homo habilis became Homo erectus. Homo erectus became Homo sapiens. And Homo sapiens became Homo sapiens sapiens. Now, what's important about those six levels? The first three, the first two, or, uh, the first two Orsolopithecines and the Homo habilis can only be found in Africa. Wow. The first three forms of the human family can only be found in Africa, and there are millions of years between Homo habilis and the Homo erectus, born in Africa, but then went into other parts of the world. There are millions of years difference, and that's the evidence that life started in Africa, because mm -hmm. the first three forms can only be found in Africa. There are no Orsolopithecines anywhere else on the planet. Wow. Now, go to the Homo habilis and go back 150,000 years ago. That is where the family of the humans came out of the Homo sapiens sapiens, and that is the Twa and Booty mm, okay. that developed themselves in the uh, central part of Africa, the Aturi forest in Congo, in um, southern Africa, amongst the people we today call the Kung. We call them the Moisha. Uh, they are derogatorily called pygmies. Yep. That's the first family. Mm. That's the first human family. And their mode of survival in beginning their civilization, their trek to where we sit right today, mm. started with being hunters and gatherers. Wow. They hunted small game and they gathered. For the most part, the men went out and they hunted. Women also hunted. But for the most part, they gathered. They gathered the berries, they gathered, gathered fruits, they gathered whatever it was, and they shaped the society upon which the man would come back in to become part of the society as it related to the women developing it. Mm -hmm. From the hunter-gatherer societies, what they did is, for instance, well, see, I like watermelon. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, right. and 
unashamedly and unapologetically. That's right. I loves me some Roja melon. I'm going to tell you that now. <laughs> That's right. Yes, sir. I know some of us are embarrassed to admit that, you know. Yeah, but it's nothing but wrong with that. I, I loves my, I, I loves my Roja melon. <laughs> but, but, but imagine eating a watermelon and there's a seed and you spit it out. Mm -hmm. And then you look down and you become conscious of, well, where you spit that, more watermelons came up. Right. And so you start spitting the seeds out. And that is going to start an agricultural science. But then you say to yourself, but I notice it takes a certain amount of time for the earth to pull that seed down. Mm. So what would happen if I dug a hole <laughs> with my finger and put the seed in there? Right. The watermelon would come quicker to me. Then they said, yeah, that's all right. But after a couple of generations, you, you know, your finger's hurting. So you say, okay, I'm not going to, well, I'm going to use a stick. So you start using a stick that saves your finger and you get deeper, the watermelons come up quicker. Mm. But then all of a sudden you say, but wait a minute, suppose I connect three sticks together. I can put three seeds in. And how about my family? I can get my family to come behind me and put the seeds in. That way I don't have to do that no more. Mm. So what you're having now is tool making. Now what you're having is, 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 the, is the perfection of agricultural science. And so now from that point, you say, but wait a minute, my, my back hurts because I keep having to bend over to put the stick in. So what if I attach these three sticks to one big stick? Right. And that way I can just walk and do that and save my back. So that's what they started to do. Mm. But then they said, but hold on a minute. Suppose I drag the stick. And I put two little hooks where I can drag the stick down the, down the farmland. And then my children can come and just throw seeds. Mm. And they say, yeah, but you know something? There's something else I got to do. Suppose I attach this stick to an animal and let the animal walk it. That's the domestication of animals. You see, the human brain is growing now. Mm. And it's learning how to do certain things. And then pretty soon, because of the success of what they're doing, more people join, more people start. And then you start having settlements that become cities, that become city-states. Mm. These early people didn't have kings and queens. Mm. They ruled by majority. You want to talk about the original concept of democracy? Because you know what democracy means. Demo means people and kratia means power. Wow. So let me just say all power to the people. Yes, sir. Because that's what democracy is. It mm -hmm. means all power is in the hands of the people. Mm -hmm. And so out of this power to the people, but then cities started growing large. And counseling the way they were doing it didn't work out so they elected people to represent them to create the society while they were working mm. and that started governments wow wow and this was in africa brother when nobody else existing on the planet at this time africans mm. had not depigmented had not morphed into okay. europeans and mm. asians this is all african people basically in this general location they are moving out to West Africa, to North Africa, to East Africa. These same Twa and Buti people were the ones that created the Kush. Mm. They were the original people that were in Kemet, mm. the Twa and Buti people. So this is the beginnings of what civilization is. Now, there's so much more that I could fill in between that. But the fact is, is that in, a, in, in an overview, that's how civilization started. That is where it started from. It's how human life, according to the science that I have studied. Mm, that's right. Wow. Dr. Kava, that right there was extremely powerful. And I remember in one of your previous lectures, you spoke about the role of the woman and how people don't usually tell us how that's where mathematics came from. So if you can, mm -hmm. can you please break down the role of the real African woman? Yes. And also, my brother Caleb, I think that we all need to wash out our minds from Western civilization before I tell you this story. That's correct. Because, because it's not easy for this civilization to face the realities of the role of women, mm. which is a sacred role. 
the role of men is a sacred role. Yeah. When I speak what I speak of women, I'm not trying to put them on a pedestal. I'm just recognizing the throne that they're already sitting on. That's right. And we as men have got to be, be able to go back into our own thought process hmm. and to understand our importance. Because if it wasn't for us, sisters would have challenges. <laughs> and if it wasn't for sisters, brothers would have challenges. And that's ma'at. Mm. And going back to those, those peoples, the Twa people, who were hunter and gatherers, developing into an agrarian society. Mm -hmm. As this is going on, you ask yourself, or you make a statement, then you ask a question. Um, the statement is, necessity is the mother of invention. For a civilization to move forward, it has to be pushed. That's right. And so, now the question is, why would a man have to count? What, what happens in a man's daily life <laughs> through a period of time that would demand that he start to count? Now, right. of course, the rising and setting of the sun, the waking up in the morning, okay, that's one reason. But women do that too. But women do something else. They go through a monthly life cycle. Yeah. And to prepare for that cycle, they have to start to count mm. the days. As they counted the days, they realized that they were on a cycle that was 28, 29, sometimes 30 days. They realized that in that 30-day cycle or the 28-day cycle, whichever it was for a particular, sometimes it, 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 it alters, but it basically is 28 to 30 days. They also realized that that cycle was broken up into four parts. Hmm. You had the point where the, the egg was first released. You had the point where uh, uh, you, you, you had it moving through the fallopian tube. You had it where it was a, a new egg. And it, there was four cycles. That is how math started, counting. The basic part of math that started it all was counting. Numbers is the beginning of math. And you ask yourself, why would a man and a woman have to count? Hmm. There really is no reason for a man to start to count outside of his daily life. But for a woman and the monthly cycle, demanded that she prepare herself for that cycle and hand that cycle down to her daughters that would also be able to go through that cycle. And that was the birth of math. That's why I said math is the language of science because now what's going to happen is that these African women are going to look up into the heavens and they're going to begin to realize that there is a celestial body that also goes through a 28, 29, 30-day cycle. Wow. They're also going to realize that it goes through four phases. Hmm. Half moon, full moon, quarter moon, full, you know, new moon. And so now they're going to correlate. And they also realize that many times the moon has a, has a physical impact on her as she's going through her cycle. Right. It also has an impact on the water. You know, you have high tide, low tide, things like that. And so the moon becomes very important. But not only that, but the moon, every calendar that Africans invented, the base of the calendar, just like numbers is the base of math, astronomy is the base of science, but the base of astronomy is creating your calendrical system, your wow. calendar. African folk had many calendars. You see what we just went through with January 1st and Happy New Year, <laughs> that's only one calendar. Wow. That's only one calendar that Africans use. That's an agricultural calendar. That's the one that Gregory took. That's why it's called a Gregorian calendar. Mm. So that's one calendar. We gave that to them. Okay, fine. But there's another calendar. And that calendar is like leap year. Like every four years we have, at the end of four years, we add a day. Africans had a calendar that at the end of every 1,460 years, they added a year. Wow, my goodness. <laughs> That's where the term leap year comes from, not yes. leap day. Ain't nobody talking about leap day. You talk about leap year. Right. 1,460. Mm. 
they added a year to the calendar to make up for the imbalance because they also had a great year calendar that was 26,000 years. And every house, there were 12 houses, and every house was 2,160 years, which in multiplication comes up to 25,920. But those 80 years between 25,000 uh, um, and, and uh, 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 25,920 to 26,000 years, that 80 year is what you have to shift in the cosmological calendar to be able to come to zero point. And if our ancestors developed a 26,000 year calendar, how many, how many cycles of 26,000 years would they have to have lived That's to be a, able to even realize that there was a calendar of 26,000 years? Now, you can go to Nabta Playa, mm -hmm. which is in Africa, right below, uh, well, it's in Kemet, but it's between Kemet and, um, and Sudan. It's called, it, uh, it's called Nabta Playa, N-A-B-T-A-P-L-A-Y-A. -A -A. Google it. Don't believe me. <laughs> or get a book called Origins, mm. uh, uh, um, Origin of Map, and they, they'll, they'll take you through the whole cycle where our ancestors laid out the lines of sight for all 12 houses. And it all centered around the 23 and a third tilt of the earth and it all circled around the North Star or Polaris. Hmm. Now, connect that with the fact that's what Harriet Tubman used. Steve to freedom, Polaris, the North Star. Because the North Star, is, there are the three pyramids, Khufu, Khafra, Menkara. The entrance is all on the north. Hmm. If you took that entrance, and if that was a telescope, all three entrances of those three pyramids point directly to the North Star. That's who we are, Brother Caleb. Hmm. And this is who they are afraid we going to remember we are. Because hmm. once you get time and space and place, you can go anywhere you want to, and hmm. no one can stop you. Wow. Wow. That's right. Our anchor, <laughs> our anchor that keeps us from being great is we believe that there's such a thing as white supremacy. Once you get rid of that anchor, your ship is ready to float. Mm. But as long as you keep thinking that you are not the person that you are and that they are, you will always be anchored and can't move. Mm. So I say, get rid of the anchor. Free your African mind. And the younger you are, the quicker you can free your African mind. Let me tell you what you can do. Mm. To the younger brothers and sisters, the world is yours if you just get rid of all these things that hold you back. You know, with everything we're going through, Brother Caleb, we're going to get past this. Mm. They, you know, they're going to try to keep you scared. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. They'll try to keep you scared. They'll try to keep you thinking that you need them to get out of this and that and all the rest of that. Vaccinations. Mm. African people had vaccinations. Mm. Vaccinations are not new, and there are other modes besides injection that you can get. When when I got my when I was a young man, young, and I got my polo um, vaccination, they had a little red dot on a cube of sugar. That's how I got my vaccination. You can get it in sugar, you can get it in injection, you can drink it in a tea. Wow. Africans had vaccinations; they still do. Vaccinations came from Africa. <laughs> it's just that these folk are buck wild. What they put in your body is different from what Africans would put in your body. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a problem with vaccinations. What I'm telling people is I trust science. Mm -hmm. I don't trust people. Mm -hmm. But I trust science. Mm -hmm. I know what a virus is. Everybody talking about how it's morphing. But that's what a virus does. Right. A virus lives to live off its host. Its purpose 
It's a parasite. Mm. It has no purpose. The only purpose that a virus has is to live off the living. And once it gets into your system, if you have a strong system, it's going to try to see where your weakest part is. Is it your heart? Is it your lungs? Is it your liver? Is it your blood? Is it your brain? Where is it? That's why they're, you know, they're telling you that, that when you get this COVID, you can get it anywhere. Because it's looking for your weakest spot. And if it can settle there, it'll start to grow on you. It'll start to attach itself to you. It will draw your energy. It'll draw your life from you. But then after a while, your immune system kicks in. And your immune system starts to fight it. And it starts to die. And then all of a sudden, it says, I ain't ready to die. So I'm going to turn myself into something else that's going to fool your immune system. And so then it goes somewhere else. That's the morph. There ain't no such thing as no South African variant. They're talking about South African variant, Brazilian variant. And then they tell you it's been in America for months. Yep. The same variant in South Africa is the same variant in Brazil. It's the same variant in California and Chicago, too. Yep. It's the same virus. But you see how much money these pharmaceuticals are making? Oh, they're making some big bucks. And everybody mm -hmm. running, please. <laughs> yes. I, I say yay or nay to vaccines. That's not my point. I'm not saying to take it. I'm not saying don't take it. Follow your heart. Follow your feelings. What I'm saying is come from a perspective that you have thought about it and you know the knowledge and you trust the science. Mm. Don't trust the people. Trust the science. Right. Science will answer your questions. Mm. Wow. Dr. Cobbler, you have been giving us so much knowledge, so much free game, and staying on that point about science. Uh, growing up from studying Egypt and, you know, being exposed to learning about my history, I would always wonder, you know, especially in history class, why we barely spoke about Africa or barely spoke about Egypt. And then the older I get being exposed to Google, uh, some of your lectures, of course, learning about all the advancements that we were making as a people, but we aren't aware or I wouldn't say we, but a lot of people aren't aware of who we were. Uh, can you please just speak on the advancements that we were making in science, mathematics as well? I, you know, I always recommend that we look at the year 525 BC, 525 years before the common era. Some people call it Christian era. I call it common era. 525 BC, Cambyses and the Persians invade Africa. And that is really the last time that Africans ever rule Kemet. Mm. Because from the Persians, it went to the Greeks, yep. to the Romans, to the Arabs, yep. to the French, to the British. Mm. And now we are where we are. That's the chain of events that happened. Our ancestors back then were way ahead of where we are right now. And that's important to understand. We have to go back to the future. And what I do, my brother, is I liken it, when we study our history, that's why I took you back before humans even existed, when we first started talking about how life came from Africa. Because it's like a slingshot. You have a slingshot. The purpose of the slingshot is to send or to project a projectile in front of you. Right. That's its purpose. The further you pull back that slingshot, the further you want to project that projectile in front of you. That's how I feel about history. Mm. You don't pull back a slingshot just to go like this. That's right. That's not the purpose. It's to project it in front of you. That's what knowledge of your past does. Knowledge of your past, the further back you go, the further into the future you can project yourself. Mm. So that when we look at our ancestors and what they achieved on just about every level, spiritually, physically, mentally, soulfully, what they were able to do was to understand something. And, and here's something that I'd just like us all to understand. The future, a civilization is only as powerful as the source of its energy. Mm. 
There's a brother, Dr. Michio Kaku, and he wrote a book, Physics of the Future. And he talks about the four different levels of civilization and the energy source from whence they became that civilization. The lowest one is Earth. That's the number one civilization. Hmm. The number two civilization is the sun, where you get your power from the sun. The number three is from the galaxy, where you derive your energy from the galaxy. And number four is the cosmos. Hmm. Now, let me take you back to number one. We now are dependent on the earth. We are literally destroying the earth for energy. We're going down deep into the waters and we're pulling up oil yeah. in order to make our cars run. <laughs> and the fossil fuels that we use for oil is living things. It's organic. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the background of all of the animals that lived thousands and thousands of years ago. We go inside and they became black. And in being mm -hmm. black, in decomposition, they hold the energy in their electrons. So what we do when we turn fossil fuel, petroleum, into gasoline for our car, we are really crystallizing blackness. Wow. So that when you begin to look at the development of the earth, we have wind power, we have water power, we have earth power. Now the purpose, our ancestors saw that and knew that. And so what they did is they used all of these facets in order to get to the sun. And by the time they started to build the Meru, which is what we call the pyramids, mm. Africans call them Meru, M-I-R-U, plural. Mir, M-I-R, is a singular pyramid. They built the pyramids for solar power. There are books they believe that those pyramids are actually power plants, nuclear power plants. Wow. We also see how tall they are, 481.4 feet. What we don't know is they're 300 and something feet deep. We don't know this. Now they're finding all these different uh, leaders, uh, royalty, Neset Biti, we call them pharaohs. They're, they're finding them all over Egypt, all over Kemet now. The, the real history is opening up now, and they're scared because the deeper they dig, the blacker they get. Right. And this is science. This ain't personal. <laughs> Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop proved that. In fact, Dr. Diop proved that so many of the mummies in France were black. They refused to give them any more uh, uh, um, skin samples. <laughs> wow. He, well, when he found out Ramses II was black, that really blew their mind. Mm. And so they had a problem with that. Yeah. But you see, you use the earth in order to get solar power. Solar power, all this that we're doing here, television, radio, uh, a washing machine, you know, dryer, uh, cars. Raji. Everybody's scared about 5G. Forget 5G. I'm talking about Raji. Mm. The sun's energy. Yeah. That's the second level of a civilization. When you derive power from the sun, that's a second. You are far beyond the earth now because the energy that you get is so powerful. That Raji that, you know, that, you know, like when you on a, on a computer and all of a sudden the energy go a little down and you lose your connection, that would never happen with Raji. R-A mm -hmm. capital G. Yes, sir. Raji. But then this is where our ancestors were now. Our ancestors were moving at the time of King Tut and Akhenaten. They were moving. There's evidence on the coffins that they understood about galactic power. Wow. Right, right up on the carvings, you will see, you know, I, you know, I, I have something up on YouTube in, in, in my uh, Comedic Wisdom School where I actually show you the, 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 the photograph, and I literally take you through every one of the images that shows you that we were aware of our rising up into the heavens and that instead of the sunlight coming down to you, we passed the sunlight that we had amongst ourselves. That's galactic power. Mm. Now, imagine using our sun so that each of us has our own star. Wow. 
Imagine if we could derive the energy from Raji. Imagine if every person on Earth had their own star in the Milky Way galaxy to derive their energy. Do you know what you could do with that? Because it's free. Hmm. And nobody can charge you for that. It's free. But, you got to take it to the next level. Because suppose you having your own star, you could tap into multiple stars in the cosmic universe. Hmm. That's the energy. Family, this is what we have to start teaching our children. Start by teaching them the sun. Just have them read about the sun. Have them learn about the energy of the sun. The light, the heat, and the sound energy. Don't forget sound energy. Mm. Sound energy is as important as heat and light energy because sound energy is what puts you onto the frequency of the cosmic reality. We're hearing sounds all the time. That's why music has such an impact on us. Right. And if I can drop something on the younger brothers of the hip hop Please culture, do. Please do. that rap, let me tell you this. <laughs> my research now is showing that beats, see, because my son was the one that said, because when, you know, when we were talking about hip hop and rap, and I was telling him about my experiences growing up in the Bronx and how what was going on with rap music and radio and things like that. He and I were getting into deep conversations and, you know, I come from a generation where words were what you listened to. Whether it be Smokey Robinson and the Miracles or The Temptations, <laughs> you know, Sam and Dave, when something wrong with my baby, something wrong with me, you know, Marvin Gaye, yes. uh, uh, Diana Ross, words meant something, right? Yeah. But in rap music, it's the beats. Mm -hmm. And my generation... The elder generation can't get past the words because they get caught up in the words, but they don't understand that it's about the beats. Mm -hmm. Now, the words have their impact. There are things we got to look at. I understand that. But, but what I'm really saying, brother, is that it's the beats that matter. When I listen to beats, when I listen to beats, I can hear the click language of South Africa. The click language of the Twa and Booty were about beats. And if anybody wants to sample what I'm talking about, check out a song by Miriam Makiba. Pata Pata. P-A-T-A. P-A-T-A. You'll hear the click language in the back of her song. When you hear the click language, associate that with beats of rap music. So that our younger generation actually is going back to the beginning of language. Because deep down inside, their ancestors are coming forward. Mm. And now more than ever, our ancestors are speaking to us through the young people. But because we have this thing that we can't get past the words that they use, the cursing, the references here and the references there, we can't break through. Because we're judging them by our standards. Right. You can't do that generationally. That's what creates the schisms. Is that I expect you to live up to my standards. What I am telling you to do. And while I do understand the elder lays out the Ma'atian ethic. There's another way that it can be done. Particularly when you are battling the forces of evil. In terms of the world that we're living in. So there's a relationship between the first language, click, because click language really is about consonants. Wow. We created vowels in order to expand our vocabulary. But really, click deals with keeping your mouth so that you're hitting hard sounds. That's what consonants are. Vowels are soft and open, ah, a, e, o, u. Whereas consonants are b, k, d, f, sa, za. Those are hard sounds. When you invert that, that becomes a click. It becomes a sound. That's the beat. Mm. Every, every, that when they say, oh, okay, if you translate that into a beat, as it's used by words, you begin to see there's something happening there. 
and that's why you see young people be doing this yeah. when they're listening yeah. because they're getting into it but why are they getting into it they're not getting into the words they're getting into the flow and the frequency and the vibration of the beats mm. but when when i as an elder is looking at them i know what they're looking i know what they're doing <laughs> yeah i can see it i just smile mm. something that we have to work on as we talk to each other moving forward mm. That's right, doctor. That's right. And one thing that I honestly love about you is as an elder, you are here for people in my age group, younger people. Mm. So learning this from you and just being able to sit down and talk about these things, it's amazing. And staying on the point about the power of sound, language as well. I know currently we've been speaking English for hundreds of years, but it's not our native tongue. Can you please speak mm. on the power of of our, our old tongues, old languages, old words, things such as that. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, there's a connection in your question and what we just spoke about. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop, brilliant scientist from Senegal, in his book, Civilizational Barbarism, he has a chapter where he talks about cultural identity. And he says that for a people to oppress another people, got nothing to do with culture now. This has to do with one people trying to oppress another people. There are three things they'll take from you. They'll take your history, they'll take your language, mm. and they'll take your psychological factor. Your psychological factor is what Dr. Leonard Jeffries calls your VIPs, your values, your interests, and your principles. Mm -hmm. And when those who wish to oppress you take your history, your language, your values, interests, and principles, they then superimpose their history their language, their values, interests, and principles. So as a human organism, if I'm in someone else's history, language, values, interests, and principles, no matter what decision I make in my life is always going to be against me and for them because I'm looking at the world through them. Yeah. And that's why we keep tripping up. Yeah. Because we are trying to measure an African existence using Eurasian model. with language, my recommendation to think about is to make medu neter, or what Greeks called hieroglyphics, yeah. the classical African language. And to make Kiswahili, the practical language. And there are reasons why Kiswahili should be chosen. All African language have their values. Yeah. Twi, Iwe, Yoruba, Ipo, all of them have their value. But Kiswahili is a language spoken in Kenya, Tanzania, and parts of Congo. The base of Kiswahili is the original African language that came out of the click language. Mm. So in using Kiswahili, and it, it borrowed different words from other languages, you know, like if you, know, like if you go to Puerto Rico, yeah. right, and you want a, a ham and cheese sandwich, what do you ask for? Okay, jamón and queso is ham and cheese. Mm. But how do you say sandwich? You say sandwich, because sandwiches are not indigenous to Puerto Rico. Uh, right. So they would not have a word for a sandwich. So <laughs> yeah. what they do is they take the word out of that language and place it in theirs. So there is borrowing of different words that go into Kiswahili, but the base of the language is the original African language spoken on our planet. Kiswahili is the largest African language spoken in the world the largest African language spoken in the world. It is the seventh largest language of all languages spoken in the world. Wow. Kiswahili has been adapted by the United Nations as the language that can be used to unite the African nation. Mm. And, Kis and Kiswahili, we've already adapted. We just celebrated Kwanzaa. <laughs> yeah. That's Kiswahili. When I was growing up, there was a company, Johnson uh, Cosmetics, and they used to say, Watu Wazuri use Afro Sheen. Mm. 
beautiful people use Afro Sheen. It was a hair product. That was key. So Kiswahili is already in our dialect. Kiswahili is already in our language. It's something that we're familiar with. And so Kiswahili should be the practical African. So if I go to Brazil, my brothers and sisters speak Portuguese. I speak English. We should be able to speak Kiswahili to each other. If I go to Holland, brothers and sisters speak Dutch. I speak English. We should be able to speak Kiswahili to each other. Mm. If I go to Nigeria and my brothers and sisters speak Yoruba, we should be able to speak Kiswahili to each other. That's the point I'm making. And if we could start there, we can take it anywhere, but we got to start somewhere. And Kiswahili is the most practical language right now. Not just that, even Rosetta Stone, you know, that language teaching? Yeah. They have Kiswahili. Wow. You know, you can go to uh, um, Barnes and Noble and they have audio tapes and, and uh, CD tapes to teach you how to speak Kiswahili. Mm. And if you're interested in what I'm saying, mm -hmm. there's a website, abibitumi.com, A-B-I-B-I-T-U-M-I.com. They teach all these African languages. It's based wow. in West Africa. Phenomenal family. Abibitumi.com. Okay. So if you wanted to follow up and study Kiswahili, if you wanted to study Meru Neta, I, I got a whole series of books on, on, on Kikongo. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've got um, their, um, their, their uh, classes on Meru Neta. And of course, our sister Riketi Wimby is the dean of Kemetology and Meru Neta. So it's here. So in terms of language, when you speak somebody else's language, you think somebody else's thoughts. Hmm. Wow, that's powerful. Yeah. Mm. Just by the nature of what it means. And Malcolm once said that English was the language of liars. <laughs> okay, now everybody laugh at that. Yeah. But you know, there's scientific truth to that. Mm. And the scientific truth to the fact that English is the language, I mean, he said it flip. You know, he, 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 was, he was trying to crack on people. Mm. But the idea is, is that in the English language, we have... Um, a word like borough. Now, in New York City, we have five boroughs. We have Manhattan, Bronx, Queens, Staten Island, Brooklyn. Yeah. B-O-R-O-U-G-H. Mm -hmm. You also have borough, which is an animal. Mm. Spelled differently. Yep. You also have to burrow a hole. Mm -hmm. They all sound alike. You would have to know the context I'm speaking to know which borough I'm talking about. That's right. But in Yoruba, it would be the inflection in your voice hmm. that would tell you which borough I meant. I could not lie in Yoruba. I might say, buru, buru. And however I intone my voice, that's the borough I meant for you to know, hmm. be it an animal, a place of residence, or a hole. And so English is a language that you can be speaking, but you don't have to be telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And by that, I could mean the animal, you might think I'm talking about a place of living. That's what he meant when he said that it, it lies mm -hmm. because it can, it, it can deceive you. Languages can deceive you. And you know, that runs in all the languages that comes up out of the romance. And of course we say it's a Roy, it's not romance, it's Romans mm. language. We get the romance like it's all love <laughs> and all the rest. It ain't got yeah. nothing. Oh, French is sound so 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 central. No, come on, stop. The the whole concept is that we have to realize who we are as a people. It's not romance languages, it's Romans language. R O M A N apostrophe S. Mm. R-O-M-A-N-C-E. That's right. So, right. language is very important. Study your history and return back to your values, interests, and principles. Because that's what everybody's talking about right now. You know, like, like, like if you're going to get on Jefferson Davis, and if you're going to get on all of the different peoples that enslaved African people, then George Washington and Thomas Jefferson ain't no better. What can I say good about George Washington? That's right. As a black man, that's right. I would have to be out of my mind. It would go against my values, interests, and principles. Yeah. Right there where I taught in the Bronx. 
there is a uh, section in the Bronx and there's a whole housing project called the Morrisania Houses, named after Governor Morris. Governor Morris owned plantation in the Caribbean and brought all of his Africans up to the Bronx and they built the Bronx. And yet we live in Governor Morris houses. Hmm. Sound like a plantation to me. Sound like the Morris plantation. So what can I say good? I, you know, I asked this of European people. <laughs> Tell me what I could say good about George Washington. Tell me what I could say good about the pedophile. Um, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Tell me what I could say good about. And not only was he was he was 54 and Sally Hemings was 14. Wow. Not just that, Sally Hemings was the half sister to Thomas Jefferson's wife. Because Thomas Jefferson's father-in-law raped a black woman and Sally Emmings was born. My goodness. Now, family, what do I got good to say about them? I would have to be out of my mind. To, to, to honor your forefathers. Your forefathers are my faux fathers. Mm. They meant me no good. Mm. And I have to be out of my mind mm. to embrace a value that had no value in me. What kind of respect could I have for myself? And so we as a people have to start thinking about our values, our interests, and our principles. You see everybody starting to change names of army bases and all the rest. Well, we're going to start changing some names of some of the projects. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yes, sir. That's, mm -hmm. that's powerful, doctor. And on that point, too, about education and our forefathers, opposed to our forefathers. I remember um, on our phone call talking about uh, the three C's, culture, curriculum, and consciousness, all three of those. And I felt like that that was very powerful. And how can we start to shape our, our young children's minds now? Because in school, you know, they're taught, these are the founding fathers, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, all of these men. And like you said, they meant no good. And we don't see Jewish, kids learning and admiring Hitler and the Nazis. But us, That's opposed right. to that, we, we have to learn about the same people who enslaved us, raped us, defiled us, everything, right? So how can we start to teach our children correctly now? Lead by example. Mm. Lead, lead by example. Show children. See, because a lot of us preach about... Um, we preach about the greatness of Africa, but we gossip and complain about each other. <laughs> That's right. Young people are looking at you saying, well, you know something, if being African was that great, why are you acting like that? Mm. We, we have to lead by example. We have to continue to laugh and we have to continue to love life and enjoy, and respect each other. That's the first thing we have to do. The first thing we have to do is like Michael Jackson say, you got to check the man or the woman in the mirror. That's right. And once you check that person, then everything else can flow from that. Mm. And we have to start our own centers. We, we have to start teaching our children, our history uh, and our culture on many different levels. It doesn't have to be in a classroom. Mm. It could be in a car dropping them off somewhere. <laughs> you know, it, it's not that hard. Our children just want to connect with the elders. Yeah. And the elders at times sometimes neglected the children. Mm. I know because, like I say, you know, my brother Caleb, I've, I've been teaching over 43 years now. I've taught every grade. I've taught every subject. Mm. And I've watched our children grow. And one of my greatest advantages in education was I started teaching in college. Uh, there, there was two years that I taught, back, one in the 80s and one in the 90s. But my, my most consistent college teaching was between 2004 and 2016. I taught at a state college here in New York. And one of my greatest advantages, as I watched my colleagues who were professors, as I watched my colleagues who had never been in classrooms with four and five-year-olds, hmm. I noticed there was a disconnect. When I was a four and five-year-old five -year educator as a kindergarten, pre-kindergarten, I, I had to take my child, my children in my classroom, I had to take their whole life into consideration. 
they wonder about you and I will be together on Monday and Wednesday between 2 and 3.30. I have to be concerned what happened to you all week long. Mm. I have to be concerned about what made you happy, what made you sad. And so I brought that concept into college. Same concept I had, except now these are anywhere between 18 and 20-something, some older than that. <laughs> I had to take an interest in them as human beings. That's missing in college. You, you have to have a vital interest in the person you're talking to. And when you talk to them, you have to talk to them authentic, authentic, authentically. And the one thing that young people can pick up is authenticity. Right. Don't try to get over on them. That's right. They'll read you like a book. Yeah. They know your feelings. They know what makes you happy. They just look at you and they can tell. What you're saying and how you're feeling in the same thing. Yeah. I can't explain it because they're too young, but they know something's wrong. Mm -hmm. We have to lead by example. And we also have to not get concerned about uh, um, culture, curriculum, and consciousness going into the school system. We have to start our own after-school programs. We have to start to mm. homeschool our children because I, I work with homeschoolers. Shaping programs that they can bring into their homes and into wherever they may be. Mm. Uh, my assessment of the teachers that we have in the Board of Education right now in the states that I've been in, I think that if we were to force them to teach this curriculum, they would do such a bad job, we would yep. end up wishing we never put it in their hands in the first place. They can't even teach our children the subjects that they majored in. If they can't teach that, what make you think they're going to be able to teach a culture that they don't even understand because they don't even know, understand their own culture? That's right. How are you going to teach me when you don't know you? Mm. <laughs> mm. And so what we have to do is look at culture and a cultural common sense. We have to look at curriculum, which is developing a way to teach this information to the children. Mm. And then you have the consciousness, which is understanding the difference between being informational and being transformational. Mm. There are some folk got a lot of information. They drop that information on you say, wow, powerful, mm. powerful. Okay, there are other people that will drop information on you that not only you learn something, but you can apply it in your life and it will transform your existence. It'll make you do something you would not have known had that person not told you that. Informational, transformational. Information was meant to be transformational. It wasn't meant just for you to know. <laughs> right. Okay, so you know. But what can you do with it? There's a Moorish proverb that says, once you learn what you set out to learn, what you learned you can throw away because it was the process of learning it that was the greatest education. Mm. And so, so we have to think about practical plans and don't overwhelm ourselves. It took us a while to get in this situation. <laughs> yep. It's going to take a while to get out. That's right. You know? But the longer we allow it to continue, the deeper the pit we're in, and the longer it's going to take to get out. Mm. Let's get out now. And family, I understand who did this to us. Mm. I understand how it happened to us. I understand what they did. I'm not letting them off the hook, mm. but I just got to say this. I take full responsibility for the position that I find myself in and the position that our people are in. Because... When you blame somebody else for the position you are in, mm. you give them the power to take you out, which is why you're trying to get them, <laughs> to blame them, yeah. so to get you out. But just like you give them the power to get you out, you also give them the power to keep you in. Now, there was a time I taught algebra. Mm. And algebra tells me that it's the search for the unknown. Just like when you were studying 1 plus 1 equals 2, well, in algebra, you take one of the knowns out, you put an unknown in, 1 plus x equals 2. Mm -hmm. Then you solve for x. Okay, and whatever you do on one side of the equation sign, ma'at, you have to do on the other side. And that's how you come up with your answer, yeah. x equals 1. 
But also what I found is that only the variables in your equation can solve your problem. Mm. White folk ain't a variable in my problem. Mm. So they can't solve my problem if they try. And when they start getting in my business, telling me, ask me what I'm doing, I say, <laughs> did I say you were a problem? I didn't say you were a problem. Why are you asking me questions? Mm. You have no right to speak. This is for me to do. Mm. See, that's what frees you when you take responsibility. Mm. Now you choose who you want to work with. Mm. As long as I'm blaming them, they're one of my variables. And they will have a say in my problem. But once you ain't a variable, you have no right to speak. Mm. I do what I have to do by any means necessary. Mm. We have to start thinking like this. I understand how we got here. But I can't afford to give you the power to keep me in my position. Mm. And to do that, I must take full responsibility for the conditions I find myself in. And do that task, that work. And I know that some of us say, please, you know, like they always, <laughs> they say, brother, please, man, don't, don't, don't tell me you're doing this for the ancestors, okay? Just, just don't tell me you're doing this for the ancestors. And I tell them I'm not. I'm not doing this for the ancestors. Everything I do, brother Caleb, I do through the ancestors for the children. Mm. I do this for the children, not for the ancestors. Why would I do it for the ancestors? They already ancestors. What could they benefit from what I'm doing? It's the children that will benefit from this work. But I do it through my ancestors because I carry the ancestors in me. Mm. And if you're wondering how many ancestors you have, let me just take you back 400 years. If I take you back to 1621, it took close to 50 million people to bring you into existence. Mm. Think about that number. You have two parents, four grandparents, eight great grandparents, and on down the line. When you get to the 20th generation, it's close to 50 million people. And you think you walk alone? You'll never walk alone. You walk with the ancestors every day. Those voices in your head that sound like your voice, those are your ancestors talking to you. When you go to sleep at night and you go through different types of situations, that's your ancestors trying to prepare you for the next day. Mm. And when you wake up and you do what you do, it's your ancestors preparing you for when you go to bed because they got something else to tell you that night. Mm. You will never walk alone. You will never walk alone. Mm. I walk with my ancestors. And I only took you back 400 years. <laughs> Suppose right. I took you back to the Twa and Buti. If I got 50 million 400 years ago, imagine if I take you about 4 million years back. How many ancestors do I have? How many ancestors do you have? How many ancestors do each and every one of us have? Mm. That's a powerful thought. You will never be alone. No matter where you are, no matter how young you are, you walk with your ancestors and your ancestors are always trying to talk to you. Always. The other thing is you are the creator having a human experience. Now, I told you I respect people religion, and I do. But my spiritual system says I am the creator. You are the creator. Every one of us is the creator having a human experience. So when you pray for something, you talk. People say, "Well, how do you pray?" Well, I just I, I talk to myself. Right. <laughs> I, I I watch God uh, brush his teeth this morning. <laughs> I watch God wash his face. That's right. <laughs> mm. And once you understand that, once you understand that you are the creator, you are the creator, and you will destine what you will. In in commit. In English, we have a word, magic. Hmm. Magic gives us the impression like um, you're going to pull a rabbit out the hat. <laughs> right. But to the African intellectual mind, magic is defined by will. You will it to happen. You will something to happen. 
you are determined to make it happen. And nothing is going to get in your way. Nothing will get in your way. That was what our ancestors did on the plantations. They perform magic. And we continue to perform magic to this very day. But we just don't know how great we are because we've been put down so long. Even when we are doing magic, we think we are inferior. We don't really understand how spiritually destined we are as a people to save this planet. This is our time right now. Mm. This is why we were brought from Africa here. Because we have the DNA of the pyramid builders. That's in our DNA. If I go back 400 years and I've got close to 50 million ancestors up in me, you know that I have some pyramid builders up in my DNA if I go back three, 4,000 years. So I have the DNA of the pyramid builders, but you see, the way the creator did it, they say, okay, you know heaven. I've placed you in this tropical place, mm -hmm. this beautiful place, and brought you all this food and given you all these wonderful things, but you talk that like you know hell, but you don't know hell. Mm. So I'm going to take a group of y'all out, mm. out of your heaven, and I'm going to place you in hell, the plantation. And I'm going to leave you just enough of my information for those of you who want to think about it to begin to return back to your consciousness. I'm going to make them strip you of everything you have. But I'm going to keep some of that pyramid building DNA in you. But you have to look for it. And our ancestors on the plantation did that. Wow. They looked for it. And they also know hell. So here we are now. They left the plantation. We were put into the projects. Mm. So we have the DNA of the project dweller. See, the projects was purgatory. Yeah. That place where you go before you go where Dr. King promised us that we would all go one day. Mm. And that's the faith that I do the work that I do. Because that last day before Dr. King was assassinated, he told us something about the mountaintop. Hmm. He told us that he wasn't going to get there with us. Hmm. He said, but that the creator had allowed him to go up to the mountain and to look over. This is prophecy in the making right here. And Dr. King said, I was allowed to look over and I've seen the promised land. Hmm. And I want you to know Tonight. Now, the reason why he said tonight was because he knew in 24 hours he wasn't going to be here. This was April 3rd, 1968. April 4th, he was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And in that full speech the night before, because you we normally only see the last one minute and 17 seconds of that speech. Yeah. Yeah. But that was a long speech. And he took us through a historical journey of life. And then he ended with this concept. I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. I may not get there with you, mm. but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. That's what I live for. I, I, I live understanding like our ancestors on the plantation who yearn for freedom and they knew that there was a very good chance, a very good probability that they would not be free. But they knew that if they just kept on keeping on, somebody would be free. And our ancestors passed that message on to the next generation. Keep on keeping on. It ain't over till we win. Mm. Understand, you may not get your goal. But if you just keep on keeping on, somebody will. Mm. Caleb, and to the family on this live, Three Millipod, we are their dreams. When they said that, they called us into existence. They made us appear as part of that 
close to 50 million people that would bring us to where we are today. And I can only say that if they could do what they did under the conditions they did it, I am embarrassed to think I'm having a hard day. That's right. I'm embarrassed. So we got to keep on keeping on. I may not get the school that I'm looking for. I'm, I, you know, I plan on Methuselahizing this. You know, I don't plan on going anytime soon. So I'm not saying like I'm going to go sometime soon. Right. I may live a very long time, but it may take longer time for me to be able to envision or to see that school that I want for our children and for our community. I may never see it, but like my ancestors, there's something I know. If I just keep on keeping on, culture, curriculum, mm. consciousness, if I just keep visiting communities, if I keep doing podcasts with mm. brothers like Caleb, if I just keep on keeping on, down the line, somebody will build that school. Mm. But you got to keep on keeping on and you never give up. You just keep on keeping on. You deal with it. And you do the best that you can un un under the conditions that you're living. All of us have our own conditions. I mean, a business, how people do what they do. I belong to a very unique club. There's a lot of people that claim they belong to the club, but they really don't. Mm -hmm. I belong to a very unique, special club club and it, it has a long title to it so please allow me to give you the title the name of the club i belong to is i mind my own damn business <laughs> that's right that's right okay but here's the other here's the other side of it <laughs> because the day i started minding my own damn business was the day i came to realize how much damn business i had to mind mm. i don't see how people have the time to be getting up in other people's right. business that's right. I really don't. That's right. and, and I'm not saying to be careful and to be righteous. You know, if somebody does something that is inappropriate, you, you know, you deal with it. I'm not talking about that. I am talking about we voluntarily get into other people's business sometimes because we really don't want to look at our own. Hmm. And we have to back up off. We as elders back up off the young people. Young people try to understand what the elders have gone through. And what they perceive when they're looking at the society that they're living in today. Understand and be cognizant of what they went through to get where they got. Just as we as the elder population look to the younger people and understand what is coming at you. And to be sensitive and understand, to have unconditional love for our people. And particularly be an example for the children. Everything I do is to make the next generation better than me, not like me, better than me. And that's the way the African society worked. Everything that the adult population did was to allow the younger generation coming through school to be able to take what they did to the next level. Mm -hmm. It's like when you sing do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. <laughs> you start with do, you end with do, but the second do, you're at a higher octave. Yeah. That's life. Mm -hmm. Dr. You end where you began, mm. but you're at a higher octave. Man, that's it. Dr. Kaba, that was phenomenal. And I will say my very last question for you uh, before we close. Uh, this is phenomenal being able to speak to an elder about knowledge, history, uh, knowledge of self. How do we bridge that gap between our elders and people that are in my age group to where we can learn from one another? Because you guys hold all the information, all the stories, all the knowledge. So how can we bridge that gap? Well, you know, it's funny because in that uh, Glory, that, which was like one of the songs that came out of the movie Selma, mm -hmm. it's Common and, and John Legend. And Common says that the younger have the energy, the elder has the knowledge. Yeah. And my, my answer to your question is very simple. You say, how do we bridge the gap? How do we make it possible for us to talk to each other? I have a solution. It's called three millipod. <laughs> That's how you do it. Mm. You talk to each other with respect and understanding. 
And as elders, we understand certain things. As younger, you understand certain things. We have to respect each other and get up off each other. That's what I meant by getting in each other's business. Where, where did the younger generation learn to do what they do? If we have a complaint with that, that's why I carry, you know, a mirror with me where I go. Mm. So when I hear elders ask, well, what's wrong with the young people? I hand them the mirror. <laughs> yeah. Because where were we? Mm. Where, where were we as the adult population when our children called out for us? What were we doing? I understand the pitfalls. I understand what we go through. My thing is I'm not blaming the elder or the younger. What I'm saying is let us talk to each other with respect. And let us begin to realize that I don't really think there's a separation between us. You know, it's like when you say, I want you to get, think out of the box. Well, my thing is I don't want you to think out of the box. I want you to understand that there is no box. Because as long as you think that there is a box, then if you think you out of the box, it means that everybody else is in the box and they can't see you. If you understand there is no box, you can see each other. All you got to do is walk towards each other. Mm. And the same is true for us. They, they keep talking about a generation gap. I don't think there's a generation gap. I just think that there are some things we got to talk about. That's right. You know? So I approach it differently. And also, when we have these conversations, you know, particularly when you have uh, male and female relationships and we're going to get together and do some workshops on mm -hmm. how we can get to... One of the first things to do, please do not start by talking about everything I hate about you. <laughs> That's right. That's start right. with everything I love about you. Mm. And then build a trust. Mm. And then when you build that trust, then you can talk about things that you differ in. Because the trust is there that what you're telling me, you're telling me through your heart and not through your mind. Mm -hmm. And the same is true for the younger and the elder. Don't start the conversation with things, the problems I have with young people or what I don't like about them old folk. <laughs> start with what I like about you. Mm -hmm. And then build the society that you want to see for the future. Mm -hmm. But the answer is communication. Talk to each other. Mm. Listen to each other. Because that's the other piece to all of this. See, we can, we can hear but not listen. We can look and not see. We can eat and not taste. <laughs> we can touch and not feel. We can sniff and not smell. See, we have, really, we have... Um, Ten senses. Five of them are physical. Well, really, we have 12. Because thinking is a sense. <laughs> yes, sir. We have a third eye, a third ear, a third nostril, a second skin, and a second tongue. That third eye is the spiritual eye. Where you can see things, not with your physical eyes, but with your intellectual eyes. You have three ears. You remember when grandma say, boy, you hear what I say? <laughs> she ain't talking about your ears. <laughs> She's talking about comprehension. Do you hear what I say? Mm -hmm. when, when we smell something that isn't in the room, that's our third nostril. When we taste something that's not in our mouth, that's our second tongue. When we think something that we ourselves didn't generate the thought, that's our second brain. And we have this, and we've been given this by the Most High, and the Most High is us within us, and know that there is nothing you can achieve. The only person that ever stops you from reaching your destination is you. You only have one enemy. Everything else is obstacles. And that one enemy is that voice within you that is always trying to convince you that you can't achieve. That's your only enemy in life. Everything else is an obstacle to get over. Because once you defeat that enemy in here, nothing out there can stop you. That's right. But you got to get this one first. You got to get this right. So you got to get that man and woman right in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you do whatever you got to do. Mm. But I want to go back to your answer again, my brother, because... 
in my book, Spirituality Before Religions, for those that are interested, you can go to Amazon and you can Google Spirituality Before Religions. You can go to my website, www.kabakamene.com, K-A-B-A-K-A-M-E-N-E.com, and you can download my six-day free e-course and my 44-page free study guide that'll give you an outline as to where I'm headed in my life and the work that I'm doing. I spent my life with our young people and I've dedicated my life to developing a concept. One story. I'm a teacher. I have a lot of stories, brother. Yeah. Caleb. I'm here to listen. Uh, I was teaching eighth grade social studies. This was towards the end of my career. This was like 2008, 2007, somewhere in there. And I, and I was teaching something about American history. Students said to me, oh, Brother Kaba, this is boring. I said, this is boring? They said, yeah, this is really boring. I said, well, how boring is it? They said, Brother Kaba, this is just boring. We don't want to hear this. I said, this is boring? They said, yeah. I said, now multiply that by 10. That's how bored I am teaching you this nonsense. <laughs> Yeah. But play the game mm. so you can get out into the world and do what you were born to do. Mm. This is a game you have to play. Right. When you play in basketball, you don't play by baseball rules. Mm -hmm. You know, when you play in soccer, you don't play by football rules. Mm -hmm. You play according to the rules of the game you're playing. This is school. This is a game. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. Give me 20 minutes to tell you what you need to do to pass this test. And I'll tell you. And, 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 and then I'll spend the other 20 minutes telling you what you need to know about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Mm. <laughs> but just give me that 20 minutes so you can play the game and pass this test. So you can get up out of here and don't go to summer school and all the other nonsense that they're going to put you in if you don't know how to play this game. This is a game. Play it. Play it well. And I say that to all of us. we got to play the game and play it well. Because the game we have to play is superficial and it's shallow. Because we, we as an African people, we live in six dimensions. Mm. Eurasians live in three. Mm. The, the first three. Mm. Length, width, and depth. Mm. Everything that we see. 3D, that's yeah. what we have. But when black folk take those three dimensions and collapse them, they create the time-space continuum which is a dimension where you, time is history, geography is space. Time-space continuum is where you are everywhere, all the time, at one time. The fourth dimension. The fifth dimension is when you walk in the light. Light is the fifth dimension. And the sixth is gravity, which is gravity is your imprint in the cosmic universe. That's why we have so much trouble, because we live in in sixth dimension in a three-dimensional world. That's like whales living in goldfish bowls. And then folk want to know why we buck wild. Mm. You, know, you, know, you know, I was once told, you know, I think a lot of black folk are schizophrenic. And I said, schizophrenic? I said, to be black and alive in America, you must be schizophrenic. Mm. I said, I got me 14 personalities. Forget <laughs> about the two. I got 14 <laughs> personalities. When I go here, I'm here. When yeah. I go there, I'm him. When I go there, I'm him. I change up all the time. My wife said, look, let me tell you something. You got 17 personalities because there's three that I know that you don't know. <laughs> to be black in America, you must be schizophrenic. That's the only way you're going to survive. The question is, are you in control of all those personalities? Because mm. when them other personalities start taking over and they start having you do stuff you shouldn't be doing, that's a whole nother thing altogether. Mm. Black folk know who to pull in. Okay, here's who I'm going to be now. Here's who I'm going to be now. That is how we've survived. And that's what we have to learn to do. Mm. So that when we get to the promised land, then we know how to do what we have to do. Amen. Dr. Cobb, again, I am I'm mind blown. Um, I see all the comments. Everybody's enjoying this. I know from our previous phone conversations, 
um, I've already told you, I would love to have you back on because I know that uh, we would love to talk about the Moors, uh, Western Africa, mm -hmm. civilization. Oh, yeah. So I would love to have you back anytime as much as possible very soon and we could just okay. keep this train rolling because I think that something like this is needed for somebody from your generation to speak with minds, especially about history. Absolutely. So I would love for Absolutely. us to turn this into a series and just keep building. So you already know, doctor, I will stay in touch. Um, but yes, most definitely, most definitely, I will make sure that we go on live uh, very soon and just keep talking about these conversations because I see people in the comments, young people as well, who, who needed this, who are learning. So I appreciate you, doctor. Thank you for your time tonight. I know you're extremely busy. So thank you for your knowledge. Um, again, this conversation it will be saved and it will be posted on YouTube. I will share that with you, okay. everything. But Dr. Cobb, again, we cannot thank you enough. We all love you, your knowledge, everything. It is amazing. So thank you. You're very welcome, my brother. And if I am busy, I'm busy because I'm talking to good people like you, you. and those that tune into your program. Keep on doing what you're doing, brother. I'm very proud of you. Thank and you, I respect what you're doing. Thank you. And I respect that you're doing it for the younger generation because I'm with you all the way. We've walked this. I've walked with young people all of my life. They've taught me so much about myself. Much respect for the younger generation. And, and I just wish you the very best to stay safe and to stay healthy to you and to yours and to everyone listening. I realize that some of us are on the edge. I realize that some of us have been going through some things. Hold on, family. Hold on. That's right. Because after the great rains, the rainbow remains, and then the sun comes out. Mm -hmm. We are on the way to our promised land. Have faith in yourself and have faith in that. Amen. Hotel. Hotel, Dr. Cobb. You have a beautiful night. All power to the people, brother. Yes, sir. All power to the people. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.